All right, we are live. Well, gentlemen, I really do appreciate you returning this evening, the 4th of July. I hope everybody's having a great day and celebrating safely. Uh, I hope you enjoy tonight. I think you will. I think we're picking up Steve's background or some, we're picking up someone's background. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll try to ignore it. Hold on. I took care of it. I... Okay. Uh, I have one announcement and then we'll get into it. Uh, I had uh, two modelers send me some information about when do you know a model is finished? And I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, I hope to get another three, four, maybe even five modelers do the same thing because I really think that, that this is a subject that's gonna be of interest, particularly to a lot of new modelers coming into it that maybe are, are new to building things and they build something and they look at it and do they show it to somebody? You know, how good is it? Am I gonna embarrass myself if I take this and show it off? And I think by trying to write something about this and put it out and talk about it, I think that's really gonna be a help to people to, to understand what building models is all about and how people that are highly skilled in it, how they know that, yeah, I'll, I'll show that model and say I built it. So if you can take a few minutes and send me an email to uh, Jim Callow at oscaleresource.com, uh, I sure would appreciate it. Like I say, I've got two and I'd like to get maybe three, four, five more uh, so that I get a variety of viewpoints and people can take their pick of which one they want to go with, but at least they'll hear from people that they can respect as model builders about what it takes for them to finish a model and, and say, I built that. So with that said, uh, I'd like to introduce the two, two, two mics again, mm -hmm. uh, Mike Lyle and Mike uh, Warman. Uh, they're going to talk again phase two of uh, how I got my critter. You remember when they did it the first time, they had started with a Shapeways uh, model and they, uh, they got the frame built and so forth and talked us through all of that. So this time is uh, phase two. And then Mike Lyle is gonna talk about the company that he mentioned that uh, I've never heard of before, LMM Tools. And he's going to talk about the tools that he uses in his model railroad from them. And I've talked to the company and the owner, and I've scheduled the owner uh, to talk with us uh, at a later time in, in uh, August, I believe it is, uh, about the company and, and really go into the tools that he makes. You know, after talking with him, it seems to me that he's not just providing tools, he's a problem solver for us. His tools actually are meant to solve problems that he's encountered in his own modeling. Uh, and I, I think that's, uh, I, I think that's great. So I was impressed because this isn't somebody that just is, you know, taking somebody else's ideas and trying to sell them as much as, you know, these are tools that he committed to that he's used in his modeling and have been beneficial to him. Uh, and then after that, we're going to do our first uh, show and talk about. So if you have a model, I hope you do, I hope you brought one uh, that you'd like to show us and talk about a little bit. Uh, after uh, the two mics are finished, then uh, we'll go to the first time that we've, we've done this and see how that goes. So Mike and Mike, thank you so very much for coming back. Uh, I hope you don't regret the first time. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope this is even better for you. So with that, have at it. Well, you know, first of all, let me wish everybody a happy 4th of July. For those people who have served in the military, thank you for your participation in that. Thank you for all you've given to us. Uh, Mike, you got something you want to say in the beginning here? Actually, you have been doing all the work on this since we uh, last met. Uh, I really can't, I mean, you show me what you've been doing, and I say, "Yeah, cool. Let's keep going." <laughs> so, Mike's Mike's an easy client to satisfy. We get along very well. We have similar likes and dislikes, 
So that works out well for us. Having said that, let me share my screen. I've got a brief PowerPoint here, or I like to think that I do. Dylan, is that something you bring up or I have to share? You gotta hit screen share, um, but you are set up to take it. All right, I hit share. And I assume I have to pick the screen now. Yep. How's that? Perfect, Ooh. we can see it. So Ooh. what we're gonna do is we're Ooh. gonna give you an update on the critter tonight. Uh, from what you saw last time, we've made some improvements, some enhancements and brought at least the upper portion closer to a finish here. Headlights. You know, the critter came with a headlight. Uh, you can see it down here. I'm, I'm pointing to it there. Uh, it's not a very impressive headlight. You know, what are we going to put on it? So I gave Michael several choices, and I showed him this one mounted. I built a little platform for it out of uh, uh, 5,000 brass and got it set up because the nose slopes down, so you couldn't just set it out on a flat box, so to speak. But that aside, Mike chose number four here. So I took number four. Uh, I'm sorry, I just lost it here and I don't know why. All right. I'm somewhat found. Give me just a moment, I'll be there. There. And as you can see, number four rocks downhill. So what I did is I took number four I took a file to it and I filed the shape of the light stand that came with it to the profile of the engine so that it would sit square and point straight ahead. I also took off the detail for the front headlight that came on the Shapeway casting. I went out and bought some 1 8 diameter evergreen. I tapered it just a little bit to create a plug, put a little epoxy on it, slid it in until it's seated, let the epoxy dry clipped the end off, and then I took some very fine files and started to profile that light to the existing hood around it, and in no time at all, it was gone. I also did an update to the air cleaner here. Uh, let me go to a little larger picture. Man, that's not it. Looking back at it, it sits within a containment frame. It also has a bottom flange. So I took some 32 thousandths, uh, brass. I cut a strip that was a 0.2 by 0.2 square. I soldered it to the base of the air filter. I then took my files and profiled it to create just a basic flange. And again, I took some 5,000 brass and you'll see up here, this is one of the items that I bought from UMM-USA, John, who's going to be a presenter here in August. That's a little handheld brake. So I took some 5,000 brass. I measured it out, I cut it out. Um, this may sound funny, I use a, I use a heavy duty exacto blade to cut this 5,000th brass. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later when I'm talking about the tools, but I use Exacto's newer Z blades, which I think is uh, electro-deposited uh, zirconium. It only takes me eight or nine passes on 5,000th to cut through it. Gives me an extremely good cut through it and allows me a very accurate cut, better than what I can achieve with a pair of shears. Yep. I also updated the, uh, the radiator here. You can see I put a frame around it, uh, soldered the brass cloth on top, built a frame, and again, uh, here's that same handbrake in the background. You know, years ago, you used to be able to go to SNK Engineer Products, which is a manufacturer and distributor of brass. And they used to do brass angles from 132nd, I don't know to how big, I'm gonna say a half inch big. Well, three, four years ago, they stopped making the finer sizes. Uh, I think the smallest you can get from there now is a quarter square angle. So each leg of the angle is a quarter inch. I needed a 16th of an inch. Uh, so I just simply took 5,000 brass, cut a piece out that was an eighth inch long, put it in that little handheld brake, folded it in half, and I ended up with a 1 by 1 bent angle. You can see it there in the picture. 
it works great. And I'll show you that at the end here and talk to the, the as one of the tools. Door latches and hinges. There's not a lot to show here. These become the hinges. It's 32 thousandths brass rod. I measured what they had for a hinge length in the model. I cut repetitive hinge lengths for all of the engine doors as well as the cab doors. And then I took some, again, same 32 thousandths brass. I did a right angle bend on it. I then put it into my Weiss folder and gave it a couple hearty squeezes and flattened it out. So you can see that's a flattened out image. That became my door handles. Handrails and grabs. I, I showed you just a quick and dirty last time. Here's the start, here's the side grabs for the side door. Over here was the um, handrails down the side of the engine, but you know, it needed to be further developed. Now, when it comes to handrails, uh, it's going to sound odd. I like to work on plywood. I, I take a ballpoint pen, I take a T-square, I take a triangle, I draw the image that I want to repeat. I use a ballpoint pen, I go over it twice, and a ballpoint pen gives me just the finest little fillet down that plywood so that when I roll that piece of phosphor bronze there, it rolls right into that fillet and stays there. I use a little bit of painter's tape, the blue painter's tape, tape it down, assemble the pieces and solder it all together. They come out well, it's very repetitive. It creates a unique template. Uh, I've been thinking about, I've had so much fun doing this, I thought about doing one of these for myself. And then putting it all together, I spent the last week learning that five minute epoxy really only lasts five minutes. And it isn't very long. Uh, the first batch of epoxy I mixed up set before I could apply it. Well, I had the five minute epoxy, I've wasted a lot of it, but uh, I'm gonna make it work for what I'm doing now, but I doubt I'd repeat that again. Now having said that, here's the engine with the hinges on, the door handles on, handrails. There's the headlight that's now been profiled for the hood. The headlight that used to be here has now been filed off, filled and filed off. You can see the air cleaner box. The air cleaner is now mounted. The stack comes up above it. Here are the mirrors that we went over last time. Let's see. Here's a couple more shots. And you can see how it came together. Here's the grabs on the side, the door handle. Those are very narrow doors. Hinges for that door. Uh, came along really nice. Pretty pleased with how it's turned out. More importantly, Mike likes what he's seen. And so in essence, Mike's my client on this. I just haven't sent him the bill yet. <laughs> you know, a path forward. I still need to mount the bell. There's a couple other tiny little details I need to finish off the cab. I know Mike wants to put a yellow, a flashing yellow marker light on top of the cab uh, since we're going to be crossing a highway on his layout. Uh, he wanted to add that to it. On the power base, I still need to do the front and back steps. Well, I probably wouldn't have needed to do it, but I have to be honest with you. You know, things I don't tell Mike, I broke one of the platform steps off. Uh, it wasn't very hard to do. A Shapeway product. Uh, I found that plastic to be pretty brittle. So what I did is I've now manufactured four of those steps. So I'm going to replace them all in brass for Mike. Uh, you know, this is going to be a running engine on Mike's layout. Uh, it needs to be able to take the abuse. I'm not sure that the Shapeway would hold up. Uh, it was pretty easy to make these. I cut some brass out of various thicknesses of a brass shape out of various thicknesses and uh, took some solder, squeezed it flat, laid it down, jigged it up and uh, put a master in the jig. And then I just kept matching the support legs. So the uh, master in the jig soldered up 
went extremely well. And that really takes me to the end of the update here on, on Mike's Critter. Uh, we're almost probably a couple of days short of priming the upper cab. And I'm going to take my time and break off the other three uh, footboards off of his base and then shave off the profiles that are built up on the side of it and uh, replace it with brass. Mike's ordering some archer rivets and we're going to put a couple of rivets in each one of the vertical support bars. I need to still solder in my support, solder in, sorry, epoxy in my support frame to the upper cab, but I needed to get all the side details put on before I did that, so that'll be one of the next steps that I do also. Uh, so let me ask, ask the people out there, any questions, any comments, anything you'd like to further discuss on this? Uh, I missed out on part one, so I'm assuming this is HO. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, hadn't realized that. This is actually S scale. S scale. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did part one, cool. and I'm sure Dylan can tell you when if you wanted to go back and watch part one. Uh, in essence, we made a sub base for it to support a stand and drive, uh, a method of attaching the upper cab to the lower base. I made a lot of modifications to it in order to get the couplers to set at the appropriate height to match with everything else. So it was, uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a nice project. I'm glad Mike has shared that project with me. Yeah, uh, Mike, GE20. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. I was just gonna say, uh, GE25 tonners are, are fun little engines to build. I've built uh, one in ON3. Oh, uh, very good. Yeah, they are. Which I, I mean, which I, might, can, I might share on show and tell. <laughs> oh, I, I hope I didn't. Uh, yeah, no, I'm sure. It, it, I'm sure as a finished model, it turned out well. I'm anxious to see it. It'll be nice to see what somebody else has done. You know, the 25 tonner. If you look on the internet at the pictures that are available of it, what you find out in no time at all is you can do almost anything you want because it was a small enough locomotive. It sat in work periods of time repetitively and then probably sat and remained idle for a long time until the next service. You know, Mike is doing an elevator, grain elevator. Uh, typically, their time of year is the fall. Engine stays parked almost all winter, almost all spring, and waits for that harvest to arrive. Uh, and then shuttles cars and works its little heart out for a couple of weeks in the fall. Uh, so what I guess I'm trying to say is, you find that those are often changed. They all have a personality of their own. There are very few that are sitting out there as delivered from the factory. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I lived in Northern Arkansas, there was a Cal Ag plant there and they had uh, a critter like this. And I kept trying to get permission to go get near it and take pictures of it. They wouldn't let me on the property. <laughs> yeah, you know, social liability being what it is and it's such a litigious, such a litigious state out there right now that people are very hesitant on letting you enter property. Right. Uh, I've been very lucky in places that I've gone, uh, seeing critters that I have. I have a, uh, I work for an engineering company. I have a project coming up here August, mid-August in a steel mill in mid-Ohio area. And they have a whole yard of little shuttle critters out there, some Alco S2s, uh, some Fairbanks Morris engines, all been converted over to run uh, run off of a DC power generated steel mill. So I'm anxious to have the opportunity to go down there. This is a large project. I'm gonna be all over that mill. These sit on the back side of it. I'm sure I might come away with a photograph or two. Good, good. Yeah, you don't oftentimes get those opportunities, but. Uh, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, well, back back when I lived in Arkansas and uh, I visited an Arkansas Lime Company, uh, went to their office and asked for permission. They said you can go anywhere you want on the property, but inside the quarry itself. And they were just very friendly and very open. They were glad to share whatever they had. And they ran a narrow gauge railroad into 2000. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's pretty nice. I, 
Unfortunately, I didn't get there until 2002 when we stayed engaged. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you, anyway, you run across those people from time to time who are extremely nice, very kind. You now, years ago, we had an SKL manufacturer who needed photographs of the back head of a 280, a consolidation. And so, you know, all right, I had helped this manufacturer out. I converted some drawings from uh, uh, AutoCAD into a printable file. I made PDFs for him so that he could reproduce them and, and look at them. And so he tasked me with trying to find a back head. Well, there's a Central Ohio Railroad owned by Jerry Jacobs. I'd never really been down there. This was before he set up the Age of Steam Roundhouse. Uh, and by the way, if you're ever in Ohio, try to try to take that in on a weekend. It's phenomenal. This is somebody's hobby at one-to-one -one scale. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Yeah, he built an entire, he had the homage come up, hand you in beams to build an old-fashioned roundhouse. And it's probably 22 stalls. Wow. Uh, with a 120-foot turntable, an old Baltimore, Ohio turntable. I forgot where it was out of. Uh, it's just phenomenal. Um, but I got sidetracked, as I often do. I called up Central Ohio Railroad, and I spoke with this foreman, and I said, hey, is there any opportunity that I can come down and take a few photographs? And he says, there's, there's only a couple of rules. He goes, sure. He goes, I respect the fact that you called and didn't show up at my doorstep. Two, as long as you're not going to sue me, if you fall and hurt yourself on this property, that's fine with me. Three, you can have access to anything you want out there. It's all covered up with tarps right now. Promise me you'll recover them as you found them. You can have run of the run of the plant out there. And we spent an entire Saturday down there taking all of the photographs that the vendor needed and then a few more. And if that wasn't good enough, he, as we were checking out, we told him we'd come back in and check out with him, and we did. And he goes, you'll notice all the brass gauges and the bells and the whistles and the horns were off all of the engines. Would you like to see them? Oh, well, yes. And so he took us in the back room, and he says, you know, it's a shame we have to take these things off the engine simply because people want to steal them. Mm -hmm. And so he took us in the back room, and here, little did I know at the time, not only were there a bunch of whistles and in bells to their engines. Well, Jerry's hobby was also collecting steam whistles. And so here were whistles from all over the United States. Uh, we had a wonderful wow. time. Wow. It's, a, it's an era that wow. has come and gone. You seldom get yep. those invites. Right, yep. Now having said that, let, yeah, me, true. let me share a little information about the tools that I recently got from UMM-USA. Uh, uh, Mike, before, Mike, before you do that, let me ask one more question. I'll ask as uh, many as you'd like. You talked about, you talked about replacing the uh, steps because of the, how fragile the uh, Shapeways model would be. Yes. I've never, I've never even touched a 3D model like, like you're working on. How fragile is it? I mean, you talk about it being on an operating railroad, uh, you just don't want to touch it? I mean, are these shelf models when you do it from Shapeway or? No, I'll tell you what. Let me, uh, let me stop sharing and go back to screen for a moment. And uh, I'll, all right, should be back to screen. Is that correct, Dylan? Yeah. All right. Here is the model right now. Now, I have it on a Tamiya paid stand. It's actually pretty durable. I don't have a lot of qualms about picking it up, handling it. What they've done is they've made this actually very thick. And I'll tell you how thick it is. The components that you don't see, for the most part, are 60 thousandths. Hmm. Yeah, there's, five, uh, there's 50 thousandths. Between 50 and 60 thousands thick. And I don't know how well that comes through to you. Yeah. What I found, Jim, is here's the stand, the power base. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but that's a very fine step mm -hmm. held on by just two little points. I and see what you mean. 
I probably shouldn't have shown you this because Mike doesn't know that one's missing yet. <laughs> Mike, that one's gone. Uh, I hope you didn't have any sentimental attachment to it. Uh, for the that most was his part, favorite one. <laughs> it probably was. There's no doubt about it. Now I probably owe him. Oh, geez, you know. Uh, to answer your question, Jim, I found it to be pretty durable unless you have fine points of attachment such as that step. And that is a very fine point of attachment. Uh, there's some unique things you learn as you start to work with this. It doesn't like to be drilled with very small drills. No, uh, I can go to a, let me look. I can go to a, uh, there, uh, number 68, 31 thousands. Goes right through it like there's no tomorrow. Uh, if I go to a 77 thousandths, which is uh, 18, excuse me, number 77, which is 18 thousandths, I broke two drills trying to go through that. Not only is it a bear to drill, it's hard to drill with a very small drill. Mm -hmm. It plugs the flutes, it gums them up, it just, it's too much like work at that point. I was very surprised by that. Shakeway also has two different qualities of plastic that you can buy depending on how much you want to spend. And I think that makes a difference as, as far as what you can drill and what you can do with it. Yeah, I believe Mike got the uh, the, the high detail plastic. The, the ultra, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and while the details very nicely done, there was still a lot of lack of better terms. I'm going to call it stepping or rastering on it. So yeah. it took a little while to clean it up. Mm -hmm. I believe that I've got it now so that by the time I hit it with primer, I believe the, uh, I have the Tamiya, what is that? Tamiya White, which is the fine surface primer. I believe it's gonna fill most everything else that's left there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think did, that'll be okay. So how did you end up drilling the small holes? Perseverance. <laughs> I, I broke one drill bit and uh, uh, there was just no retrieving it. Uh, I'll be honest, the holes are, sh I would have liked to put through holes in for the mirrors. The mirrors were the finest cut. Uh, the mirrors do not have through holes drilled. I ended up trimming the mirror back of the support pieces. I like to, I like to sink the phosphor bronze deep in there, butter it with epoxy and pull it back to the right height. And that way the epoxy sets within the hole that you've drilled, not just on the interior surface. And then I come back later with a fine set of nippers and cut off what extends inside. And that gives me a very clean inside surface. I know I've then achieved a lot of contact between the phosphor bronze, uh, the casting and the epoxy. I couldn't do it on this. I had to then go in and butter a little epoxy on each one of the holes on each one of the little mirror uh, brackets, which is phosphor bronze, and then push the phosphor bronze home after I've measured it and trimmed it. So it's a little less robust with the mirrors than the handrails. The handrails are all through the inside of the engine. So I've drilled through the body, to the outside, to the bottom, extended it through and then trimmed them all and then touched it with a file to flatten them. Uh, it's not the same with the mirrors. Is uh, epoxy the only glue that'll work? Well, um, I, gee, how do I say this nicely? I somewhat have a, uh, a dislike of AC. I, I find that over time, AC in some applications, and it may be just the kind that I've used, seems to crystallize and becomes fragile or crystallizes and releases. Uh, epoxy, I've never had anything release from epoxy. Uh, I'll call it a less friendly glue uh, to work with than AC. AC has its applications. I do use it from time to time, but when I'm doing metal to, we'll call it, a form of plastic substrate, I use epoxy. 
anything else that we should look look out for if we're going to buy this from uh, Shapeways and try to build one? What other issues should we be careful about besides the drilling of the holes and so forth? Those were really the only issues that I that I faced was how brittle some of the smaller parts are as they're attached. And you know, most most bodies don't have those fine parts attached. Uh, this power frame did. And as cautious as I was with it, I still broke one. Uh, you know, it's not my engine to begin with, so I've, I've handled it with kid gloves. Uh, that and while you can drill bigger holes, tiny holes, it's not friendly for tiny holes. At least that's my experience. <laughs> now, I, I will say this. Uh, I have two, two different manufacturers of drills in a vial. And the two drills that I broke all had their cutting flutes up. Now, I noticed I had a couple of drills in the same vial with cutting flutes down. I pulled one of those up, chucked it into my favorite uh, drill bit holder, and I had much better luck. Slow going, hard to drill, but I had much better success with that older drill than with the replacements that I had gotten. Uh, as I told my fiance last night, I'm gonna probably throw all of the drills with the flutes up away in that mm. vial, just because I had so many problems with it. Mm. You know, it isn't a problem until you break one off inside the casting. <laughs> and then it's a, it's, a, it's a headache. And in this plastic, I couldn't retrieve it. I tried. Uh, yeah. So I just haven't done that too many times. Yeah, it just it uh, it's one of those you just get up, you swear, you get up, you walk away, you get something cold to drink, you come back with a better attitude, and hmm. you try to take it out, and there was just no taking it out. So fortunately, it's a small enough hole that I drilled one adjacent to it, and unless you know about it, and I'm not going to tell Mike which one it is, uh, <laughs> so it'll be it'll be a test for him to find it. <laughs> in search of Jim any other questions no that's it thank you so much let me reshare my screen here and I'll show you the UM uh, here we go UMM-USA uh, it really stands for Unique Modelers Models. Oh, excuse me, Unique Master Models. And he's, a, you can tell from his opening shot, he's a fabulous aeronautical modeler. I give John a ton of credit. John is European, speaks with a European accent, has all of the, and I say this as a compliment, old European things about him, customer driven. You can call him between 11 o'clock in the morning and 11 o'clock at night. I placed my order Wednesday night at about oh, 9.30, quarter to 10. He stayed up till two o'clock in the morning, wrapped it, created a, a pickup label for it so it would go out first thing in the morning. I had the tools that I bought Friday, ordered them Wednesday, ordered them online, paid for them online, had a problem, had to send a second order. Uh, we automatically default to a second shipping fee. So he packaged it all in one package and refunded that instantly to my account. I have nothing but praise for John. Uh, John tried to talk me out of the break that I bought because he thought it was going to be too big, but he, I didn't share with him the, all of the reasons that I had bought the break, but he's not the kind of guy that's going to go in there and hey, you can buy this for 20 bucks, but for 28 bucks, you can buy this one. It's not his nature. Uh, very good guy. I hope you enjoy him when you get him on here in August. And I'm delighted. Uh, I accepted Jim's invitation to, uh, to introduce him because I enjoy John. Now, 15 years ago, I bought this saw. Turns out that my buddy, Mike Warman, has the same saw. You know, I was cutting a lot of plastics. This thing has a kerf. The cut of this saw is less than six thousandths wide. It's 
blades, top and bottom, as you see it there. And you have the ability to stack the blades. So if you want to make parallel cuts, you can make parallel cuts all at the same time. Hmm. So if you need a piece of plastic, I don't care, one thousandths thick, you could cut it on here by just spacing the blades out appropriately and in one cut have that piece drop out to you. I was very impressed by that saw and I bought that, like I said, 15 years ago. And that's when I first encountered uh, John at UMM USA. Recently, I wanted to pick up a couple more tools for the modeling that I do. So I went to John again and, and there we go. And I bought a set of small miter boxes. Mm. Uh, the one on the left is about a quarter inch. I'm going to get that wrong. The one on the left is about a half inch wide. The one in the middle is about a quarter inch wide. And this one is set up for tubing, doing right angle cuts on tubing. But if you'll notice on here, these are really set up for 90 degree cuts, 45 degree cuts, and 30 degree cuts. And, you know, these are things that John made a number of years ago. And uh, I'll be very honest and say there's a company out there who now makes these miter boxes and sells them. But instead of being made in Europe and being sent to the United States, they make them in China and send them to the United States. And they're a knockoff. I feel for John. John had a very bad experience associated with this. He was approached by somebody who had said, I'd like to represent you. I think you have some great tools and bought some. And then months later in their catalog are duplicates of John's tools. Mm -hmm. It happens. Uh, I'll stick with the European made tools here. John has brought his prices down. So he's very competitive now with that other company who has done this. And uh, I'll support John for that. And the other thing that I bought, as I said before, is, oh, come on, technical difficulties, I apologize. I bought a, about a six inch long handbrake from John. As I said before, uh, K&S Engineer Products, who used to sell brass angles in fine sizes, no longer does. Uh, I needed to make some angles in order to trim out that radiator from Mike. And I needed a good excuse to buy a few more tools, don't we all? <laughs> uh, so what I've done is I've taken 5,000 brass, I've cut it eighth inch wide, I chuck it up in the little handbrake. Uh, you know, I use my uh, vernier calipers. You know, I use the sharp point in order to scribe on the brass uh, eighth inch wide strips. I cut all my strips with a exacto blade. So I'll, I'll have six strips there. I'll reset my uh, vernier calipers to half that distance. So it's 0 0.0625 and I'll scribe two little ticks. And then I line those little ticks up into the handbrake. I don't know if you can see that piece of brass in there. Mm -hmm. And it's just as simple as, he calls this photo etch folder. I call it a handbrake. It's just as easy as taking that and doing this. Now, John is also smart enough to know that brass has a little bit of a memory. So you have to bend it a little over 90 degrees in order to get it to bounce back to 90. And there's the little angle. Wow. Wow. Now, I tried it with a piece of 10,000 brass. Now, and I'll make no bones about this. It's a sold as a photo, a photo etch bender. A photo inch bender is five thousandths or less. It folded that ten thousandths. It struggled. I put a little bit of a divot in, into the bottom part of the brake. It was never advertised to fold ten thousandths. I used it beyond what it was advertised for. I suffered the consequences. Now what I haven't tried and what I want to try soon is I want to try to uh, cut some strips out of 10 thousandths. I still need some larger angle. I'd like it to be a little bit thicker than 5 thousandths because actually I want it to be structural in nature. I want to be able to provide some support from it. So 
I'm going to dead soften a piece of 10 thousandths uh, to a strip. I'm going to put it back in a break and see if the break will work on softened 10 thousandths brass. Uh, if not, maybe I'll talk to John someday and see if he's willing to make one that's a little more heavy that would allow me to make some thicker brass parts so that I can continue scratch building. I had met a fellow last year in uh, Indiana at the ONS scale show. A very talented individual made all of his hopper cars out of scratch materials, KNS brass, as well as what did he use? Paint thinner cans for the bodies. Soldered them all together. I can't remember his name. I want to say it's Bill Schwartz. Did a great job. But he feels that he may have to retire because he can't get the brass. Uh, so I want to be able to go to the show this year and take along this handbrake and take along some brass and let him play with it. It may allow him to continue making the models, though the brass that he was buying is for O scale, a little larger, and was 14,000 thick, whereas this is really made for five. And I'll hold these up. You've already seen the catalog for them. These are the little miter boxes. You can see the little stops in there. There's a stop at 45, 90, and 30 degrees. That was the large one, which is about a half inch. Here is the little one I've used an awful lot. Now, those are extremely fine cuts in there for the miter. Uh, I use my new saw. It's an old new saw, but I use my new saw for that. The blade that I have gives me about a three to four thousandths kerf. So it fits inside that miter perfectly. It allows me to cut whatever I want to cut at whatever angle, whatever degree I want to cut it. So the tool works extremely well with what I need to allow me to accomplish what I want. Uh, like I said, John puts out a very good tool. I'm very pleased with it. Uh, Mike? Yes. That is actually designed though for the, uh, the little saw you showed earlier, the little uh, one you had for like 15 years. Yes. Yeah. That, and it those, was. Those little no, miter boxes. Of, yeah. Yeah, you're 100% right. He designed it for that saw. Right. Now, right. there are upgraded blades I'm going to share with Mike here. I bought some stainless steel blades from him. Now, those are all photo etched to achieve a cutting surface. Uh, they're a lot more durable than the old, I'm going to call it carbon steel blades that he had. Uh, but yes, you're 100% right. They're really set up to take that saw and to work with that saw. But it also works with the fine the real fine blade and the newel saw that I have. Uh, now, I will say that I bought all of these tools from John. They weren't given to me for a review. I have no complaints about any of the tools that I've bought from John. So, you know, this isn't a, uh, I'm trying to give you an honest opinion on uh, my take and my use of these tools. Uh, so I'm very pleased with them. And I'll, I'll show you two more things, uh, not related to UMM USA. Uh, you know, it's always nice to look at what other people do and what other people use. Uh, I went to a beading shop. My fiance likes to make her own bracelets from time to time. And so I'm in this shop that sells beads. And the young lady sitting there and on her work table is this little plastic frame that holds pliers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's called Beadalon, B E A D A L O N. I have several of these, and it does just such a fine job of holding the pliers to be organized. Uh, it's those little finds that every now and then you get lucky on. Now, as Mike Wells knows, I like to solder. And uh, I have a number of the old Radio Shack spools of solder. They're 
12 thousandths, 15 thousandths thick. Instead of chasing a roll around the uh, work table, I took an old paper dispenser and has just the right size holder and I just pull my solder off that little spool as much as I need, clip off what I need or allow it to continuously feed. Someday I might even get, uh, uh, you know, it's always these engineer minds. I tend to overthink things. I thought about putting in a small brass tube to allow it to spool out and pay out so it wouldn't flop around. Yeah, that's down the road. <laughs> but I use a tape dispenser to, to dispense my solder. It works wonderful. Anything I can answer for anybody about those tools. What's the price range? Uh, well, you know, I should have mentioned that also. Uh, the little one, $12. Okay. The break, I don't recall, but I'll tell you what, I can go back to share screen and think the prices are there. I actually bought, That's okay. I was gonna say, I bought the three miter boxes together as a package. Uh, let's do this and let's do this. And of course the price isn't there. I'm gonna say I paid $30 <laughs> for the three. Now, as I said, John is old world European. Each one of these miter boxes came in an individual plastic envelope. They were all gathered together in a Ziploc. They're all gathered together and put into a heavier Ziploc. That Ziploc was then put inside of a mailing envelope that went inside of another envelope that went inside of it. He had four mailing envelopes, heavy cardboard envelopes, all put together as the outside package. It was like, it was like playing with the Russian doll. I opened up the first one, there was a smaller envelope. I opened up the second one, there was a smaller one. I opened up the third, here was another one. I opened up the fourth, and out came the plastic bag. The Ziploc bag, I unzipped the bag, and out came four or five Ziploc bags, each with an individual element in it. <coughs> this is what he does, I guess, between 11 o'clock at night and two o'clock in the morning. I've never received something that was packaged as well as this was. I was, you know, I'm, I'm glad I didn't try to video the unboxing for you. It would have taken a half hour. Mm -hmm. Wow. Anything else I can answer for you? I've, I've used these for two or three years and uh, I use them on every model. Oh, are they the UMM? Yes. Yep. Oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah, I am uh, very impressed by his by his products. I have no complaints about it. I have some replacement blades, Mike, that are from CMK, Check Masters Kits. Oh. Haven't used them yet. Are you familiar with these? I believe I am, and I believe that's actually what I have in here now. Okay. No, I so, don't. I'm sorry. This is, uh, I bought these from UMM, and they're called H-A-U-L-E-R, Howler, Hot Tools, and they're a stainless steel. Okay. Yeah. In fact, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I bought them through UMM, but they're made in uh, the Czech Republic. Yes. And I wanted to say, I thought that's where his original blades came from. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it doesn't say. But yes, this was out of the Czech Republic also. The original saw was called a JL, J as in Joseph, L as in Larry, C as in Charlie. And uh, if you go to his website now, you'll also find the stainless steel blades, which are very durable. Yeah, here's the package that my knife set came in, JLC. Oh, there you go. Yep. Just updated packaging. I have the older ones. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I've had my saw 15 years. I've cut a ton of styrene, a ton <clears throat> of plastic with it. Yeah. Fenton and, Wells put me onto these a few years ago. He's, uh, he's a scratch builder, kit basher, primarily for freight, plastic freight cars, styrene freight cars. And the other thing that I like about them, 
is they're also very good at creating grooves. If you need to create a seam in the plastic, you can drag this saw, put it up to a single tooth, drag it a few times, and it will carve in a nice little groove. Yeah, Jack, I've been pretty impressed by his tools. I, uh, I have to say, uh, I appreciate a well thought out tool. I appreciate a durable tool. He makes both uh, easy to win my confidence in him and, uh, and repeat business because of that. Well, gentlemen, the, re the reason that uh, the reason I invited him to uh, to appear on the show was uh, after hearing what Mike uh, said about him, and it took me three telephone calls uh, before I could convince him, and I had to talk to a very close friend of his on a conference call <laughs> uh, to finally convince him to uh, to maybe try our show and to uh, be willing to, uh, I guess, stick his neck out in the model railroad community again. Because as Mike says, his first outing uh, did not sit well and did not go well as far as he was concerned. So he, he really hasn't, quote, been in the model railroad community. Uh, he's very large in other hobby areas, but just not the model railroad community. And listening to Mike talk about it, and then after personally talking to uh, John myself, I really think his tools were designed to solve problems. Uh, he doesn't like for me to call him the problem solver tool maker, <laughs> uh, but I do think that's exactly what he is uh, creating for us and for the ho various hobbies. Uh, because he, he had a need, he made a tool. And uh, that, that's where you are. And I think if we have a need and he doesn't have a tool that he thinks will work, I think he'll make us a tool. That's why I think he is a true problem solver for the hobby. And I hope that if you get a chance that uh, uh, you won't miss his appearance and, and uh, talk to him about uh, the tools that you need or the tools that you'd like because he's a nice guy. Uh, and I, I think you'll be impressed with him when you meet him. Jim, what is the uh, date of that August meeting? Hold on just a second. I'll have to try to find it for you. I've got it here on my telephone. Uh, it is August 29th. He's going to be here and uh, a close friend of his uh, who writes for Fine Scale Modeler. I don't know whether you all are familiar with that publication or not. I subscribe to it uh, because of, of uh, I'm interested in what other hobbies are doing and what modelers and other hobbies are doing. And I've written about some of the model airplane hobbyists uh, before. And I recently wrote about one guy that uh, is a model uh, a plastic car modeler. And some of the techniques that they use and some of the tools that they use in their hobbies, I think have applicability to, uh, to our hobby. Uh, but it's funny, a, a lot of people are model railroaders and if it doesn't say model railroad on it, they're not interested in taking a look at it. So, you know, it, it may be strange. But I do think there's a lot of good people out there that if we can, if we can take the best of what they've got and use it, you know, that's to our benefit. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. So anyway, I hope that uh, you'll try to save it. The armor guy. And Bill's cutting out again. Yeah. I couldn't understand him. Yeah, I, I I caught like I, I caught like a vowel. That <sighs> <laughs> they. <laughs> Bill, I'm just saying that. Bill, you have, uh, Bill, you have my email. If you have a question, email. Me. Okay. Okay. Okay.
just because his network keeps cutting in and out. It, it is what it is. The, the sad part is, is uh, I don't even know what causes it. If I knew what caused it, I could give you an idea on what to do. Well, as I mentioned, there's a storm going through this area. Um, Dylan, you might want to mention the chat option. Oh, there's an idea. People can just type in a chat question also. All right. That's a good point. So yeah, um, Jack basically covered it. There is a chat bar in here. So if you guys have a question and want to add something, but you don't want to interrupt, uh, feel free to type it out. We have it. It's a tool for us. Might as well use it. Okay. Mike, I really do, Mike, the two mics, I really do appreciate you guys coming back and doing this again for us. And if you have anything else you'd like to add, now would be a time to do it. Well, I, I, I'd like to speak for Mike also here. We've had a good time with this. This has been uh, a very good experience with everybody that's out there. Everybody that's out there has been very kind to us in regards to the questions, in regards to the comments. Uh, give us a couple of months, we'll have this painted. I've been working with Mike to develop a logo uh, for his greenery. And of course, he's got to get some decals made. That may be a little bit further down the road, but uh, in a couple of months, we'll bring you back a finished painted model from his layout, a couple of shots, uh, just as a, a final or a wrap up, so to speak. Fantastic, look forward to it. Well, again, thank you for all of you for allowing us this opportunity to share with you what we've been doing. Uh, Michael? I was excited about doing this when Rob showed me uh, two years ago, he had brought that uh, model over to a, a show, and I thought, man, we we could do this. You know, this this would be really cool. So I thank you, Jim, for letting us do this. Uh, Listen, it's no thanks due to me. It's my honor to, to <laughs> you guys to be here. I can't thank you enough for taking the time and to want to do it. Uh, I I think it's fantastic, and I can't thank you the both of you enough. All right, so let's let's try something different tonight. Show and talk about. Anybody got a model they'd like to show us and talk about? Well, I got something to show if I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Dylan, why don't you uh, click on share screen? Yep, share screen. Okay. All right. If you have to, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if your network's just having an issue with the video and the audio at the same time. Could could be. As, as uh, Jack says, there's storms in the area here too. Been off and on today. So, uh, okay, share screen, share. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay. All right. Uh, you should have a picture of a stock car in front of you. This is a, a scratch built stock car. It was uh, written up in O-Scale trains. Um, it was, uh, it's all styrene. Oh. That's styrene, it looks like wood. That's styrene. Nice. What scale is it? Uh, all, all my stuff is O-Scale. This is O-Standard gauge P48. Okay. And that's the underframe of it. That is very well detailed. Thank you. This this here is a uh, Carolina Craftsman kit. Uh, I uh, highly modified it, changed the roofing, uh, added the tin sheet to the front where the prototype was done, uh, and added this the, the sidewalk chips in front from Tom York. Uh, added uh, window screens. Uh, to the wind and in addition to the side of the building and one to the back. Very uh, nice. I, uh, I, I have various ways of doing the weathered wood look. Uh, I don't like using uh, rubber cement or anything else that the peeling of paint 
feeling uh, pain effect. Uh, I like to use either a dabbing the paint on or doing a streaking effect of whether it would. In the 80s, when Grant came with the contest with uh, the uh, Gazette magazine and Grantline had a contest of do something with the Porter kit, and this is a model of the Mishcal Lumber Company, number 11. Uh, other people have done this engine, but this was the first time of uh, using that kit. And Mike, for you, this is a this is a Chivers kit that uh, I modified to resemble the, in many ways, the Arkansas Line uh, Company engine. Uh, did quite a bit of uh, redetailing on it, a lot of cutting away and uh, uh, adding pieces. Um, the weathering on the frame uh, is done with chalks for the most part, except for the grease and oil around the bearings. Um, I used uh, uh, AK Interactive, which is a military modeler uh, company, uh, grease and oil to create that grease and oil effect. Huh. Uh, uh, I got the idea for the grease and oil and the, and the spillage coming out of the, the box there and stuff uh, used from this locomotive here. Hmm. Uh huh. Well, it looked like there's uh, about. I like, the, I like well, much, much yesterday, I'll say. <laughs> uh, when. Same thing. And... Bill, going back to the cornerstone, I really like how you got that rag it, hanging on the, on it the, is yeah. the rail. Uh, <laughs> and Bill's cutting in and out again. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh oh, well, that's it. Okay, that rag is uh, is actually hiding. A what? Into it. I have yet to add LED lighting to it, and uh, uh, a few. So if I caught that right, he hasn't added. You haven't added the LED Call lighting yet. Bumper. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the way the coupler is located, those are right. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. No. But uh, all the little details on it are are based on Arkansas Lime Company and stuff were all part of the Arkansas lunch and they yeah. used to uh, change the hook thing back together again to, to certain that's it nice that's my nice my arm rest. Tell. yeah nice arm rest yes pardon me i like the arm rest also the engineer's oh, yeah. arm rest oh, oh thank you that's just a, a, a casting yeah uh, that's just a casting uh from uh, precision scale mm -hmm. And that's that's it. Fantastic! Thank you so very much. Anybody else? I'll take I'll, I'll take one. I've got something. I mentioned it in the past when I screwed it up. <laughs> As might remember that little. So basically, this is what I'm working on. It, obviously, if you can't see it well, I apologize. Um, let me screen share the prototype real quick. All right, you guys can all see it? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, out of sight. Wow. So I, this is the only picture of this, anything related to this company I've been able to find. It was a hmm. plaster company out of, outside of Las Vegas. And somebody on the ON30 group had sent this and posted this and said, oh, this would be kind of cool. I'm looking at it. And I'm like, that's a porter. Because the company's, what little I was able to find is that Porter built this. So I have a copy of Porter's light locomotive catalog. Basically, they're narrow gauge stock locomotives that they did. Like the, you know, the different industrial locomotives, stuff they did to mainline patterns, stuff like that. I went looking in the catalog and I couldn't find a single thing that even resembled this. So my best guess is that this was a custom build. That's my best guess because there's, there's nothing that even remotely looks like it in the, in the catalog. Hmm. There is a similar wheel arrangement, but the locomotive is like three times the size. 
and it's standard gauge. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is this doing in the light locomotives catalog? So I figured, okay, what, what in the world could I use for a chassis for this? And, um, well, I just happened to be looking on eBay. I'm looking HO scale 080s. And I found two Northwest short line Southern Pacific shop switchers. And I'm looking at them like, and then it just kind of hit me. I'm like, that's exactly what I need. That's the chassis. So I bought them both, probably paid a bit too much for them, but I'm like, I'm not letting them go because I want to build two of these. So let's hop over to my CAD program. You guys can see it a bit better. So basically I'm like, okay, it doesn't need to be exact, but I want to make something similar. So I've got two versions. I got the single piece body. I got the single piece body that I designed figuring out okay, just because I'm like, oh, I'm wondering what it will cost. And then I've got the three piece body with the body, the rear frame and the cab and then the pilot up there. So the idea was let's make something similar and it doesn't need to be exact, but let's, if it's a one-off porter, then, you know, what are the odds that you're, anyone's going to recognize it or realize what it is anyway? So you can't really rivet count with it. So I'm, I'm like, okay, that's good. Um, the first one I screwed up royally. So where you see the second row of rivets to the front, that is right about where the front of the tank was originally. I screwed up measuring royally, and I mean royally. Those of you that remember when I brought it up, basically what I did is I made it about 20 millimeters too short. So I get the parts. I'm like, okay, let's test fit them. And the smoke box is back over the second driver. And I'm like, okay, what in the name of God did I do there? Couldn't figure it out. So I'm like, mm, okay, it is what it is. So – the problem I'm running into now, the original one, once I got that one fixed, I noticed that, well, for one, the rear frame needed to be reinforced. So I redid that. That's these little bars under here. And this block was meant to help level it. Well, it leveled the body, but then I made the block a little bit too tall. <laughs> so This is just a comedy of errors on my part, but hey, you learn by doing it. And the problem is, you know, when my printer's still down, it's not like I can print the parts myself. You know, my printer basically needs an overhaul at this point, And I can't even get into the garage at this point to do it. It, it is what it is. Not much I can do about it. So what I'm going to probably do is I'm probably just going to lop this block off or part of it off on the, the frame and the single piece body just so it will sit level and then I'll just shim the smoke box saddle. Um, after that, I'm, I'm going to paint one of these myself. I, I personally like brush painting with Tamiya acrylics. They actually, when you thin them out enough, you can't see any brush strokes. It looks like a sprayed on paint, which is good. I'm going to send one of these to a professional because I want it to look nice. So I'm basically going to send it to Al Judy and say, here, can you make this look pretty for me? Not to knock my ability. I can paint stuff. I, I had a, a while ago, and I need to figure out what I did with it. I had a Pierce Tool Company USRA switcher, the big burly 080 they did back in the 40s. And I put one of those together. I never finished it because I couldn't get the mechanism to work right because just everything kept binding up. But I did all the paint work on it. And I did that, and I you couldn't tell it was – you know, brush painted. I've got a Santa Fe from, you know, third rail that I've got basically sitting in limbo because I need to figure out, well, crud, when I did the, um, when I did the 080, that was already all in pieces. So I painted it and then assembled, you know, the running gear. Well, um, the Santa Fe I've got, which frankly, it's in the other room. I'm not going to get it because I'll, with my luck, I'll just drop it because it's not even held together by screws right now. <clears throat> so my uh, and, and that's the other one I'm working on is how in the world am I going to paint this without getting paint all over the running gear and it just looking like crap and yeah. I don't know I, a buddy of mine is looking for one so he could do a central of Georgia engine I'm like well if you want it you can have it 
But if I end up finishing it, it's a Boston and Albany engine. Mm-hmm. Because, but that's a that's a whole other story. We're focused on the <laughs> OEO. I'll be honest with you. Like I said, I can't find any bloody other picture than the one I showed you guys. And it irritates me to no end. Because how many of these small companies do you run into when you're doing your research that there's nothing? You run into it all the time. It's annoying as all hell. Yep. Because then the reference books they reference are this like book made by a local historical society that has basically been out of commission for years that you can't find copies of because all the co- they only made like 100 copies. And they were made before World War I and printed, so good luck finding one. That's basically that. Um, as a, like I said, I'm basically going to, once I figure out, I, I need to get my rotary drill working again because that is just... Me, me and power tools don't mix. <laughs> I will be totally upfront. Now, I'm designing this on my computer because that's my strong suit. And I'd rather play to my strengths. I tried scratch building a boiler when I first started, figuring, okay, I'll just scratch build a boiler. I'll, I'll make the barrel and we'll add all the details on it. Well, I'll be nice and happy. Um, calling it a, a, an, an abominable failure <laughs> would probably be underselling it. That's the boiler that taught me I can't scratch build anything to save my life. Thank God for CAD. But that's that's basically what I'm working on is trying to get this thing together. Now, ideally, if I could figure out how to replace that motor with something smaller, I would be a very happy man because then you could do a full sided firebox and you could put details in there and whatnot. And, well, the problem is the firebox sides basically impinge on the motor. Hmm. So unless you replace that motor, you can't have a full firebox. You're going to see the motor when you look through the cab window anyway, which, okay, it is what it is. It's O N 30. We're not perfectionists. We're as long as we, it looks right and we're happy with it. I, I'll live. It's just, I, I took this one apart and then I ended up t- putting it back together. It is, it's not like a straight motor mount. Like for a can motor where you've got the, you know, the screws that go into your motor and, um, you know, it screws right up into it. It doesn't do that. It is a, basically a molded brass flange that mounts to the corners of the motor. And good luck. And I am not smart enough to figure out how to make a motor mount where everything's going to line up right. I'm smart, yes, but I'm not that smart. <laughs> so it is what it is. I may end up sending this to one of the people I w- I've worked with and say, hey, can you figure out how to remotor that for me? Because he deals with chassis all the time and he designs chassis. Is he over in England? Yes. Could this take six months to get back because of the postal service? Also, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, when I, with the international shipping just on a total side note here, the international shipping system is a god damn mess. It really is. Like, like um, when I bring in mechanisms from Europe because I use them for a few of my kits, well, what used to take two weeks takes two to three months mm. before it leaves Frankfurt. And then who knows? And then if it gets into New York, New York City has basically become a black hole. And good luck getting anything out of there in a reasonable amount of time. I got nothing. I, I can't control that. So I'm stuck with it. So if I was to send that out and say, Hey, Hey, uh, Joe Schmo, can you remotor this for me? Um, I'm only calling him Joe Schmo because I'll be honest with you. I am. I, I think the long day is getting to me and I just can't even remember his name, even though we talk all the time. <laughs> it, it's, it's sad. It's, it's sad. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. That's kind of bad, especially considering I helped him design the superstructure for a trench locomotive, <laughs> which is sad. 
Um, he's a guy who owns Loco. Uh, Mark Clark. There we go. That's his name. He, he's the guy who owns Locos and stuff over in England. He does a lot of, you know, professional grade locomotive kits. Um, I'd probably send this to him and say, hey, can you figure out how to remotor this? Because he'd at least know how to design the mount and what motor will fit. Me? Mm, not so much. And then there's the other issue you've got. You know, with one pole of your motor, you're one to an insulated pickup strip on one side of the engine. On the other, you're picking up power from the other side of the frame. And, well... I have no clue how I'm going to isolate the motor because there's, there's really no space to put in like a rubber spacer in the motor mount. So that way it doesn't pick up power from the uninsulated side of the frame. So I'm, I'm basically at an impasse because if you'd want to throw like DCC or sound in it and in this thing, there is plenty of room. I don't know how to do it. It's it's becoming more of a long term project, but it's how do you answer those questions? Because that's you're you're one of the things you run into in ON thirty a lot is you're limited by your chassis. You know, I've had a few people tell me, Oh, wouldn't it be great if you made an East Broad Top Mikado? Yes, you're right. And I know what chassis to use. The problem is the shape of the frame for it is not regular. Good luck measuring it. Somebody probably could, but it'd have to be somebody with more experience than me. <laughs> At least so that way the boiler sits on it right. You don't have gaps. You know, everything's all nice and tight. It's a nice, tight fit. And then it looks right. I would need somebody, again, with more experience than myself. I may be good, but I know when I don't know what I'm doing. That, that to me is probably one of the best pieces of advice I could ever give to anyone. If you get above your, if you're over your head, learn to admit you're over your head and ask for <laughs> help. Seriously. Like, um, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many times I've gotten in over my head on something and it blew up in my face because I didn't know when to admit at the time anyway, because when you're a young 16 year old kid, you don't really know what to look for to realize you're over your head. At this point, I kind of know because I've learned because I've had enough stuff blow up in my face. You know, it's not like you can see the burn marks or anything. The beard covers <laughs> it. Um, that's really about it. It's just figuring out, basically trying to get it so everything fits right. So then I can paint it and make it look all nice and pretty and then worry about the rest of it later. You need a mentor. <laughs> I have mentors, which is good. But the sad part is, is when your mentors are not like Al Judy, I'll talk to Al a lot when I need, when I get stuck. I'll talk to Kevin a lot when I get stuck. I talk to Calvin Witt who helped me learn CAD when I get stuck. It's not so much as everyone has a little piece of the puzzle. It's me figuring out how that puzzle goes together. I'd hate to say it. I have had nights where I, where I stayed up in bed until four in the morning because I couldn't sleep because it was on my mind. And then all of a sudden I'll go, Eureka. I'll get, I'll, I'll hop out of bed, get my, get on my computer and do it. I've had those moments. And it sounds like too much work, Dylan. You need a hobby. <laughs> you know, Jack, the, the sad part is, is I, I've had a, this job has basically become my hobby in a way. Because for one, I enjoy the challenge. It, it's more challenging. It, it, it's challenging. It's that and the people I deal with, nobody tells you you're an idiot. They tell you, okay, here's an idea on how to make that crazy idea work. And, I, and that's why I love ON30. You know, it, it's just nobody just will sit down and tell you you're wrong. They'll tell you, here's how you can make this crazy idea work. Here's how I've done something similar in the past. So here's the idea. Um, but Dylan, I'll expect to hear from you how you know the model is finished. <laughs> It'll be finished when it's painted and I can run it forwards and backwards and nothing falls off. <laughs> That's my standard for good enough on this one. <laughs> Just because the cha until I can figure out how to remotor the chassis and fit, you know, sounded DCC. 
you know, there's a reason I don't screw around with chassis. I leave it to a professional. That's why I sent that ON240 out to be regaged by uh, Terry, Terry Van Winkle because Terry knows brass. He knows how to regauge brass. Me, I'd screw it up. And well, I don't want to screw that one up because when you spend 600 bucks on a model, you want, it to, you want it to work. Yeah. Especially when it's of the locomotive that you still have not seen run in person, but you were there when they were finishing it and you just went, oh my God, these guys are geniuses. Seriously, if you guys ever look up the Wisconsin Waterville and Farmington and the work they had to do to rebuild number nine, and you, you'd, you'd look at their CMO, uh, Jason Lamontaini, you, you'd probably look at this guy and you'd, you'd just assume he's another guy. But the amount of brain power they basically had to put into correcting every single little fault with this engine, faults that have been on it since it was built. So that way it could run safely because they just ran it like that. You'll look at him and you'll go, dude, where have you been all my life? <laughs> Where have you been in the preservation in, in the preservation community? Why why don't we have like ten of you? You'd wish you could clone the guy. Very smart guy, and th and I and I will say this about the main guys: there there seems to be a congregation of genius around the main narrow gauge museums, as far as the mechanical side of things go. I mean, they're literally bu they're building a locomotive from scratch at this point. They're rebuilding another one. They've designed a new boiler for it that's bigger than the old one. And it still fits the chassis. And they, they're, they're brilliant. They really are. I, I can't say enough about them. But then again, when you see the handiwork and you realize, oh, hey, they were just supporting the locomotive's weight through the firebox. And the firebox was just all, there's all these cracks in it. You're like, no, that's really not safe. But what they do, they basically redesigned it with a frame around the firebox. That's what they did on number nine. And that's on top of basically correcting the cylinders because the cylinders were different sizes from construction. <laughs> correcting wheels, making two wheel sets that are not the same, that are just a hair off on size, making those work together and run square. They, seriously, these guys are brilliant. Like museums across the country, you, you, there there could not be enough Jason Lamontanes and and people like him. There, there's not enough of them to go around. But that's a completely different ramble, and I've been rambling. <laughs> uh, D D Dylan. Yep. What's the name? Of, what's the name of that company again? The plaster company. Uh, the plaster company, Arden yeah. Plaster Company. A R D I N. A R D E N. It was outside of e Las Vegas. Okay. Like I said, that engine, uh, it doesn't even show up as a pattern in Porter's catalog. That's, it, it's, it's okay. I have a, I have a, I got a friend in the Vegas area who's a, who's a model railroad person. He might be able to find some information. Oh, if he can, I would be very happy. Mm -hmm. Because I'd like to know more about it. You know, Supposedly, it went out of business in 1912 because there was a fire or something. That's what I, that's the impression I've been left with, but I don't know how accurate that is. It is what it is. Yeah. There's a lot of those little companies that are out there in the desert. When I used to live in uh, California, I spent a lot of time out there. And uh, there's a lot of really cool little railroads that ran in the desert out there, especially around Death Valley. Okay, who else? Dylan, if you figured out how to take the motor off of that uh, unit. I have. It's four screws. The problem is it's not like the screws line up well with another motor. It's literally the screws are in the corner of the motor. Well, once you get the motor off, then you can always build a brass plate to hold the motor. It'll Screw work. that down to a frame, and then you've got a new motor mount. Yeah, that would probably do it. It's the easiest way. Just a quick, My only concern is I don't have the tools to make sure everything's centered. Yeah. Because if that's off center, you're going to have the gear skip, and that is going to drive me insane. I, I'd rather it work right, you know, the well, first time. 
have you figured out what size the um, shaft is that the worm gear is on? Uh, looks like a two millimeter shaft from when I've measured it. So, so it, any, so pretty any much any, uh, yeah, pretty much any can motor yeah. would work. It's just a matter of making the mount for it. And then the other side of it is you need a motor that's not terribly tall. Now I can get motors that are pretty short and, and stubby. Um, the same guy I get the motors through for the repower kits for the rail truck. Mm -hmm. um, he has motors that would probably work. My, my biggest concern is making the mount and making sure it stays centered. Because if it's not centered, it's not going to work, and it's and, and I want it to work right the first time. You well, know what I mean? Because that's if you were to take that to a show, and all of a sudden it just starts skipping along, like doo -doo -doo, and stop. That that's kind of embarrassing. Yeah, it's just a bunch. Well, the whole thing is if you don't have something like a drill press and a decent X Y table to center every all your holes. And yeah, you're kind of limited on tools. Right. Joe, uh, when you did CAD draw it. I have tried doing the CAD drawings. My only, again, the issue there is I've already screwed up a measure in this engine once, and I don't know how I screwed it out. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what I did when I screwed up with the measurements the first time. So my concern is, okay, is it how I measured it? Because I don't know what I did. Like on the second one, when I corrected, I literally just measured the distance mm. from the center of the smoke box saddle to the center of the smoke box saddle and the boiler and just lengthened it accordingly. So without knowing where I screwed up, I'm a little bit leery to just jump at it. You know, a 3D printed frame, you know, a nylon frame would just mean you can insulate it a lot easier. Yeah, but you, what you need is more of a brass frame to mount the motor solid. And a can motors has insulated um, windings anyway. Right. I'm not so worried about a metal frame. Only because of my experience with the repower kits so far. Yeah. Once that motor is fixed in place with some Loctite, it doesn't go anywhere. And the frame, it's not like it's fragile either. It, it, it could take, it, it, it'll stay where it needs to stay. It's just my, my leery on what I screwed up on that. And it's try once I figure out what I did, I can fix it. You can fix it, yeah. Right. Well, I just pulled up the Porter catalog again. Probably, let me see if I can get this to, ro I'll probably have to save the picture so I can rotate it. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Let me rotate it. I wonder this if it is... a, a. What was that, Bill? It, it, I said, I wonder if it could possibly be a Glover locomotive. No, it was listed as Porter. And this. Porters. Yeah, it was listed as Porter built. And from the looks of it, they used a standard, oh, okay. the standard 080 chassis, but with a way smaller boiler on it. Like this is the one, let me screen share it real quick. This is the closest thing in their catalog I found, but it's way too big. This is a 42 inch gauge locomotive, so okay. And it was built, suppose, according to the catalog, this is an example of one that was built for use in Japan, I think. Well, that's too big to be the Arden engine. The boiler is way too big. The cylinders are way too big. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know if they just like cobbled it together from stock parts they had, made a custom frame and boiler. That's my best guess. I, I, I like it. Like, Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's just, I would love to know, well, you know, maybe it is a Glover. Who knows? If it's a Glover, that would explain why I haven't found anything in the Porter catalog that looks anything like it. That would explain a lot. But this is the closest thing in the Porter catalog that even resembles it. Of course, Glover used slanted right. frames a lot. I, li I like the way they, yeah, they did it. 
you know, it, uh, I, I like I liked the way that it listed on that Porter catalog for that locomotive. It was uh, oh, eight wheel connected locomotive, wide and narrow gauge. <laughs> well, Porter narrow would, gauge. well, Porter <laughs> they left, would, would scale their design. They were narrow down gaugers. <laughs> they were, but they would build, they could yeah, build yeah. their locomotives at just about any gauge. Like the frames, right. it's, the right. only difference was the frame spacing, which was pretty, they right. standardized. I mean, Porter knew what they were doing. They were, they, nobody can say that Porter didn't know what they were doing. They were, they, they had standardization of industrial designs basically down to a science. Right, they did. I mean, you look at the, like, you look at the eight ton Porter that they used, that like Bachman made for 130. Well, that same basic pattern existed in one form or another for basically Porter's entire industrial locomotive production. Mm -hmm. You know, differences in like the cab stylings, the tank stylings, but the wheels were basically the same. It's some of them still had the slanted cylinders if they were the small eight ton engines. If they got a little bit bigger, they went to the standard, they reused the cylinders off of one of the larger 040s. They still had the steam dome over the firebox. Yep. They just did it. Yep. But they, they, they got it down to a science. And there were, you know, people, other people who did that too. Uh, Schenectady comes to mind. Because um, they made a, a series of 480 cross-compound locomotives. They were pretty much all identical. They went to the Southern Pacific. They went to the Fitchburg Railroad. And they went to the Boston and Albany. Yeah, Aside and, and, from cabs, they were basically identical. And a, another company that was good for that kind of stuff was Carter that made uh, rolling stock in California. Yes, this is true. Uh, they, they, had, they had a standardized design and they, they just sell you the, the metal parts and you cut your own wood and stuff. Yeah, and, let the, and that's why you got so much Carter variation. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, these are Carter parts, but yeah, we yep. cut the wood ourselves. Yep. Exactly. Yep. All righty. Anybody so Jim, else have anything? Well, listen, this is, uh, this is run on. It's about uh, time for us to go uh, watch the fireworks if you're already where you all are. So uh, thank you so much for coming. Next time, uh, Dylan has arranged somebody that I think is really going to be special. And I'd like for him to introduce him. But before he does, I want to mention something. I had a modeler call me up and say, why don't you take the last 10 minutes of your show or 15 minutes of your show and let a modeler run his railroad? And because I think a lot of people would be interested to know about the railroads that, uh, that are out there and who's doing them and how they run and what they're what they're all about and he's agreed he'll he'll be on our show next saturday uh to run his railroad um and so we're going to try it and, and see if you all like it and what you think of the idea uh if you're interested in doing something like that during the last part of a, a show please let me know so i can try to schedule it in uh, because we want to try to do what everybody's interested in and, and uh, make these as uh, valuable for you as we can. And if this is something that you'd like to see, then, then I'm all for it. So, Dylan, if you'd like to introduce our guest for next Saturday. All right. So I mean, next Wednesday. I'm sorry. Just come don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So uh, our guest right now, and Dan just emailed me back and just said, yeah, I should still be around if something happens. You know, he'll let us know. But the plan is for Dan Bigda to join us. Um, if you he's been, his layout, the Hamden Terminal has been in O scale trains. He does regular O scale mm -hmm. two rail. Yeah. Um, he is also the guy guilty of getting me into O N thirty. So I jokingly tell people when they ask, "How did you get become a manufacturer?" I jokingly tell them it's Dan's fault um, <laughs> because he got me into it. Um, he was a mentor to me basically when I needed it because at, the at that point in my life, I was not on stable footing. He basically helped, basically put me on the right, basically put me, get my head back on straight after I had a, a spate of deaths in the family. You mean this is the better you? 
I get, yeah, this is the better me. <laughs> he, he, he's tr truly a good man, a great, a great modeler, a, a close confidant of mine that I've gone to for advice. Um, he, I, I do think when we talk, you guys are going to find it quite enjoyable. You know, just talk, listening to Dan, what he has done, because he is, if you come up with a list of what he's done he, for his day job, he basically does rail car leasing. Um, so he'll do lease fleets and whatnot, stuff like that. He's worked for Lionel. So he's done model building as well. It's, it's going to be a very interesting conversation. He's a very, a very enlightening guy to listen to. And he, he's got a very, just, he's got a very distinct view on things that I think you guys will appreciate. On top of just being a generally very good person. But that's Dan Bigda, and you can expect to see him on with us on Wednesday. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. I hope everybody else is. And we'll look forward to seeing everybody come back, hopefully uh, well and well-fed, on Wednesday. <laughs>